Okay, thank you for coming along to see Ari's talk on disrupting the classroom in a good way. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the introduction, but Ari's a very interesting guy. I encourage you to talk to him in the break, um, and I'm sure he's more than happy to talk to any button about this interesting stuff he's doing. So thank you, Ari. Alrighty, so for once I'm not talking about databases. I've, I've, that company still exists, still pays the mortgage. This is what I do for another fun um, and also a little bit of profit already. It does have a business model. Um, so I've been disrupting the classroom a little bit and um, as you've seen yesterday, Claire is doing similar things with, uh, with her expertise of, of archaeology and history and geography. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what, uh, what I've been up to and what OpenSTEM has been, has been up to and why and how. Um, and some of the how and why you might actually disagree with, that's cool too, we can have a conversation about that. Um, we're kind of finding a way, we're kind of finding our way while we're doing this, um, because some of this stuff just hasn't been done in recent memory, if at all. Um, so first of all, what do we do? So we do anything related to science, technology, engineering, and maths, and you know, Claire was talking yesterday about history and archaeology. Yes, that's technology. Yeah, there's some technology in there, there's science in there, you know, that there's all those things um, that get used. You can't really separate all those subjects, you know. When, when a school says, we're now doing maths, yeah, that's wonderful, but, you know, when you apply it to the real world, very quickly it starts involving science and, and geography and technology, and it's all, and, and, and what's the difference between maths and engineering? You know, you can't do one without the other, really. Um, but, you know, we'll get back to that and why schools try to do that. They're not particularly good reasons necessarily, but they're kind of stuck with it, so we try to work with that. The main thing we're trying to do here is enabling students with stuff they can touch. And the reason is that many kids really only pick things up when they can either touch something or actually finick with it. It's not quite the same thing, yeah? Some kids just need to touch something and they're happy and at that, at that point their brain is engaged and it starts working. Other people need to turn it upside down, pick it apart, figure out what makes it tick, sometimes put it back together again, that'd be wonderful, and, um, and move on from there. So those are the kinesthetics. Um, so most of the classroom work is not like that. You know, you have a mathematics workbook, doesn't contain this stuff. So how do you make mathematics tangible? Well, the real world is full of it, but it doesn't often enter in the classroom, and that's what we're trying to do. Most kids are very, very visual. So yes, they can, they can read by, you know, age eight, nine, they've got a fairly good grip on that. They can read a little bit earlier, but you know, it becomes much more, more competent than that, that age. But um, they really need quite a bit of color on pages, and they need images. It doesn't actually matter that much what kind of images they are, as long as they're not too distracting but sticking an image and a bit of color on a page actually really helps the child engage with that page, essentially. It's part of the story. Now, yes, text documents, uh, you know, textbooks for schools now have that, you know? So if you're wondering what is all that colorful, those colorful people doing funky stuff, why are they in the corner of the page? This is why. Um, it's not just gratuitous, it makes sense. Um, third reason why we're doing this, and again, this is something that doesn't doesn't happen often in the classroom. It has, the stuff we do has direct feedback, and I'll, I'll show you that in a bit. Um, that means that whatever happens, it gives the child, the student, direct information about what they've been doing, what they've been doing right and wrong. They don't have to ask a teacher, did I do the sum right? Uh, can you spell check this for me? Or ask another, uh, ask another student. They actually get that information themselves. Now, it's sometimes nice to ha work with other, other humans on something and get some feedback on it, but it's very empowering to actually be able to decide for yourself whether you're actually making progress and doing a stepwise approach to solving a problem. So the direct feedback mechanism for, for me is quite important. And then there are quite a few organizations that bounce into a school and do what we call an incursion and hop in with a box of Lego and then the Lego gets built and we do this experience and an hour and a half later the Lego walks back out to school. I love Lego, but this is so uncool. Um, by the time that person walks out the door, all the kids are just hyped up and want to play with it. And that's exactly what they should be doing, and it, it's disappearing, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. So we try to do whole projects with schools rather than 
just bouncing in and out, giving a bit of an experience. Um, I'm not opposed to experiences, but the experience should be longer, otherwise it doesn't actually gain an experience. It's just, um, it becomes like a show, an entertainment thing, you know? It's like watching a movie, you, you enjoy it, and then you might have some mental things to take away from it, but that you don't have anything beyond that. Um, okay, we like to work with entire classes. Um, so, not an extension program. We do do extension programs, we like, we like doing that, but I like working with an entire class because who selects who is going to be in the special program to do problem solving, robotics, you know? Inevitably, in there will be some funny self-selection by whoever is involved. The child might unselect themselves because they think it's something not for them. But they have no idea, they don't know this stuff yet, so they kind of need to be involved without being pushed into it or having to select to be in it. So we like to have this done without pre-selection, be really inclusive, and we're just very simply inclusive by not making any selection at all. We just want to work with one class or all senior classes in a school, which is the way it's been um, for the t stuff that I'm talking about today in particular, which is the robotics and programming. Um, that tends to be like all senior classes in a, in a school. Um, that works quite well. Then we also do some extra stuff, but I'm not focusing on that. So, what kind of stuff do we do? Robotics, and that's what I'll, I'll talk about more um, today, with a bit of soldering and programming. And yes, we do do soldering. Um, brewing ginger beer. Um, of course, why not? Um, it's just something I did anyway, and um, since a couple of years, and I've, I've played with it, with, um, with a more junior class and kind of guided the uh, classroom through it. And they loved it so much, I thought we can scale this up and actually turn it into a scientific project. Um, so the ginger beer involves um, coming up with a, the whole scientific, working through the whole scientific process of a project, um, doing research, coming up with a hypothesis, working through all those things, working out the life cycle of yeast, um, and actually creating ginger beer from scratch. We're not actually adding yeast, we're actually catching it from the environment. So yes, I see an awesome in the, <laughs> yes. So that's the, that's the thing, because that's how it used to be done and there's actually nothing wrong with it and there's actually great benefits to doing it that way. Um, if you add your own yeast, there's all kinds of things that go differently, which means you need to more closely control the environment. If you do it the natural way, there's all kinds of things that naturally go correct um, and we've scaled it up a bit, um, so we now make barrels of about 15 liters, which is quite significant for a classroom. So that works through into business and economics subject, because a classroom can actually do this every week, every couple of weeks, and deliver it to the school tuck shop or the school cafe, and they can sell it. Um, each of these uh, barrels will deliver between $60 dollars of income for the school. If you calculate it back to two cups and you sell them each for, uh, I don't know, a dollar or, or, or whatever, that works out quite nicely. It's a continuous production line. So you can work out the you know, cost of manufacturing, um, what do we sell it for, marketing. It, it plays quite nicely. So are we just making ginger beer for a bit of fun in the classroom, a bit of chemistry? No, it's actually a whole broad thing. So that's the way. We're trying to think, and again, it's hands-on, and because it's non-alcoholic, kids can actually taste the wares, which is which is kind of nice. Um, yesterday, you've you've hopefully heard or seen um, heard and seen Claire talk about the history of archaeology and geography. Um, that's of course recorded, so do please have a look at that. Um, Claire has also developed an orienteering program, um, so of course there's mathematics in there, but um, it also fits very neatly into HPE health and physical ed. Now health and physical ed in the national curriculum is actually much broader than running around the oval and, and kicking a ball and that kind of thing. It has a lot of social interaction, um, teamwork, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, cultural diversity, it's actually hugely broad and also the health aspects come, come into it because it is HPE. Um, so yeah, that all fits in with orienteering, and orienteering is slightly different from kicking a ball around. You know, kicking a ball around is excellent, and running around is excellent, but orienteering combines these things in a different way and engages different kids in a different way. Then something I'm currently mainly pondering about um, and talking with various people is digital and analog electronics, um, really down to the base components. Um, 
because I think that is somewhat sadly getting lost again. Um, and I think it's beneficial for kids to actually play with that, but we'll get back to that. Then 3D printers and printing. Um, many schools, and particularly high schools, now have a 3D printer. It tends to be part of the um, um, digital, um, what's it called? Design, design tech, design technology um, department. And you know, with various tools, things get designed and, and printed, which is lovely. Um, I'd like them to use different tools rather than just AutoCAD, but you know that it, I like that these things are done. I like that schools are picking this up. What is forgotten in that space is that the printer itself is an object of learning, completely missed. It is full of mathematics, science, engineering, and it's completely open source. You can pick the thing apart and understand why it does what it does, how it does. Um, I was talking to Vic Oliver and he said, well, you can act out G code, you know, the commands that the printer uses, you can act that out in the classroom. You can move a print head in the classroom, which is one of the, one of the students, and you can make them do stuff. And that, that works wonderfully well. And you know, that kind of thing is missing. And then what Claire demonstrated yesterday is you can print resources for the school. And that's another thing that these printers have not been doing. So that's what we like to talk to schools about. And it's just some information we give away because they have the printers already. I just like, would like them to use their, the toolkit they have better. That would be wonderful. Um, unfortunately, they tend to buy very turnkey 3D printers. Um, so in terms of maintenance and actually learning more about how they work, it's more difficult and they're not actually cheaper. So I'm broadening the conversation with them, but you know, if they already have one, why not use it for the best they can? Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about today specifically is robots. Um, specifically, this kind of robot. That will be difficult to pick, I think. I'll park it here. I'll park it in this way and I'll turn it on so it has a nice light. There you go. Has light. Will bleep. All right. Um, so, what's this build form and how does it work and what do we do with them? This is how it comes. It's like a little IKEA flat pack. Okay? I don't have a flat pack, we're completely out of the version ones. By the way, I didn't design it. The awesome Ben Pert in the UK has created these. They're called Mirrorbots, and he kickstarted it early last year. Um, there's now a version two coming. I'll show you what the version two likes, uh, looks like in a bit. So it comes as a flat pack, and these are all the mechanical um, main bits. Um, so it's laser cut, laminated MDF. One side is laminated, which makes it white, and it's MDF. So it doesn't like water, but other than that, it's pretty sturdy. It shouldn't be taken apart and put together an awful lot of times because it will come more loose, but you know, it, it can be done. Someone has connected to it. Who connected to it? Go and fess up. Well done, Isepi, excellent. All right, that's fine. Don't put the pen down there. Okay, I'll put the paper underneath. Just to be sure people behave, okay. Yes, you can connect to it. 10.10.100.254, um, do coordinate that you don't do it with more people. Uh, the SSID is mirrorable. And that's exactly the kind of thing that should happen. Okay. But if you can restrain yourself, James, that would be wonderful because you can't really see where it goes here. And yes, oh dear. Um, <laughs> I've started something now. Anyway, so those are mechanics. Um, so what do we do with the electronics? They come like this into the classroom. Okay, we're really not messing around with this. We're talking about 10 year olds. Yeah, so year, year five and six mainly, um, but we've worked with some composite classes that are four, five, six, and the year fours do just fine. Okay, so this comes in raw components. Admittedly, you know, the SMD components on the, um, on the Arduino here are put together, but they do solder the headers on the Arduino. Um, that goes, goes pretty well. Um, what I should also mention here is the little Wi-Fi module there. That is a complete web server. It's quite impressive. So actually, that's, that's what James just was connecting to. Um, and it serves up a web page and that, that allows the control. But we'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit. So, you know, the kids learn about servos, stepper motors, the difference between them. And um, what a circuit board is, what headers are, sockets, all those bits are discussed fairly briefly, but you know, it's an introduction, okay? And then we solder them in the classroom. So we have a nice plastic crate, my soldering kit, 
And each of those soldering kits has a number of extension leads, um, power boards, um, four soldering irons, very heavy, nice stands with a, um, one of those copper ball um, cleaning um, balls. You, should see, you can just see it at the, in the corner there in the stand. I can, can I? No, I don't have a mouse there. You can possibly just see something there. So it doesn't use a sponge. Sponges are a complete pain um, to work with. We're not using um, soldering stations. First of all, they're quite expensive, the good ones. And the second problem is that if kids will solder at home, very likely they will not have a soldering station. So we're adding a convenience that they then have to kind of struggle their way through the inconvenience at home. If we teach them with the cheap base stuff, and it's, it's good quality, but it is cheap, you know, the soldering iron is $25 or some or less, um, they will just learn the techniques properly and then they can also use a soldering station when they can get their hands on it, but they'll be perfectly happy with this. We've now also, at the request of parents, started selling kits of essentially our classroom set, which we've assembled from a variety of sources to provide kids with the opportunity to, to do more soldering at home, because some amazingly, well, <laughs> in some cases amazingly, they take a liking to it and they want to do more. Great, hadn't picked that up, so <laughs> now, now we do. Um, so we do put all those things together. There's also a set of helping hands. You can't quite see it on this, on this picture, I suppose. Um, so it's a set of, of arms where you can grip, you can grip the, um, the circuit board. Um, and then the way we um, allow people to attach a header to the circuit board. And, um, oh, you wanted to take a photo of the next one? You can have the slides later, it's also good. <laughs> um, so, I mean, putting components on the circuit boards and then having it, having it available um, properly without needing too many hands. You need those helping hands. You need a piece of blue tack. Um, so as you can tell, we're really, really high tech with this stuff. There are other professional ways of doing this, but blue tech work, works wonderfully. Yeah? So if you have a little, um, uh, you know, a little resistor to, to put on the circuit board, you can just put it in, stuff some blue tack against it, and it'll stay put. That works wonderfully. Okay, so the soldering. So all the kids learn to, learn to solder. We usually do an afternoon, uh, about an hour, uh, between half an hour and an hour, where we teach the teacher how to solder. Um, they may not actually do much of it, but they'll be able to know, you know, oversee the students doing soldering. And, um, you know, know, know the little pitfalls that you inevitably encounter. They will have done it themselves. And of course it gives them some, um, some cred with the kids. You know, they're not asking the kids to do something they haven't done themselves. And they can do it after school quietly without the kids looking. So, you know, that's a good start. And then some parents. We get parent volunteers to help. So for each crate, we have four, um, four soldering kits like that. And we set them up on a regular, you know, regular school table. A couple of, it's usually two sheets of newspaper. And on top of that is our gear. It's near a window, because um, getting proper ventilation going is downright impossible you know there's no standard way of doing it these are primary schools they do not have science labs generally we could we could run to the nearest high school and 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 rent out the lab and then there's all kinds of other problems so doing it near a window in the primary school is perfectly fine if there's no window in the classroom we go to the hall and it works out just fine we need nice light uh, preferably natural as you can see here and um and and we work it out that way um, we do use regular lead tin solder, not the fancy new lead free stuff. Um, the irons are cheaper <laughs> still, um, and it is less finicky to work with. Um, we may change that in the future, but at the moment that's just the, um, someone else. Um, that's just the way we've, we've started it now. As long as there's enough ventilation, there doesn't seem to be any significant problems. It gets to some kids' eyes and throat, um, maybe related to asthma, there's like a correlation between the asthma sensitivity and the, and, and the shoulder. It's just a matter of, you know, walk away for a tick, let it, let it settle, and after that it's okay. Earlier on we weren't aware of this, um, and it caused a little bit more hassle, but that's, that's essentially now been solved by, you know, making kids aware of it beforehand and, um, and just working with, with, the, with the, the kid and the, um, and the teacher to, you know, if they, if they feel themselves affected, they just walk away for a bit until it settles, and after that it tends to be okay. Um, finally, in terms of safety, um, 
we have words beforehand um, in the way of I will hold up the soldering iron hold, held by the metal end, and we have a nice conversation about that. Um, I know why <laughs> it might be not wise to do that if it's just been plugged in, even if it is now unplugged, it will be freaking hot. Um, you know, technical term. And um, we send it around the classroom and they're able to actually touch it and whatever. And after that, they're over it. They do not need to finick with it again while it's really, really hot. And we reference it um, in terms of temperature to um, the oven at home. Oven at home gets to about 250 degrees. Um, these soldering irons are about 315 or something. So we say, you know, let's say twice as hot. Very, very hot. You don't want to be doing that. And little raise of hands um, in terms of, you know, who's been touching stoves and ovens at home and you get these sheepish hands and I can stick my paw up. I've done this a time. So, you know, the, they're over it then. We haven't had any incidents so far. We've had two little incidents with the same person of slightly burnt hair. Um, it's just a matter of tying it back. And we mentioned that, but sometimes something gets loose and, you know, all you get is a bit of burnt hair. It smells absolutely ghastly. Um, you know, it's like having hair stuck in a, in a hair dryer. So, you know, th that's the worst that has happened so far. I fully expect someone to burn their pore at some point, but well, so what? That, that's fine. I'm not fussed by that. Um, of course, we have to do some paperwork uh, for, you know, the occupational health and safety in the classroom. That's perfectly fine. We've done that now. We can repeat it across, across other, other schools, um, but that is for the specific setup that we have. Um, so it may not translate um, if someone else wants to go, go into school, it might have, a, have different requirements. We do have kids wear a pair of safety glasses as well. It's something I usually don't bother with at home, but you know, it's an extra safety measure that, um, that kids could use. We also have special goggles um, that can be put over um, a head that already contains glasses. Okay, so we, we have all those things in, in place. Um, but these safety glasses, Fairly, fairly standard, medium impact, um, clear, fog-free, scratch-free, you know, just to be sure that kids can toss them around a little bit. Um, they actually also fit over a standard pair of glasses and it actually usually works out okay. Um, so, and everybody gets a certificate of achievement that they have done soldering. So, um, for a recent school like this one, this is Groveley in, in Brisbane, um, about a hundred more people on this planet now know soldering because the three senior classes have done the uh, have done the workshops and some some parents as well. Um, so this is year well year four, five, and six. So it's age nine to about twelve have been doing soldering in class. Um, oh, I should mention also with the soldering we have um, only one child soldering at a time at any desk. And as I mentioned, we have up to four desks. There could be one other person watching. Okay, but we specifically keep it clear to, um, to allow people to actually focus and this um, make sure that the class clowns don't have an audience and then they work much better. They're able to concentrate and they actually do really well. So we really haven't had a hassle at all. Okay, so what we deliver to the classes is this box and they keep the crate. Uh, so that contains all the kits. You see five kits and uh, the little bits of cardboard are just mirror bot kits. There's one built that one that I just put on there as a demo. Um, there's a roll of paper, I don't use it anymore because it leaks through um, if you put a felt tip pen on it. We now use just regular regular thick paper. Um, there's a set of, of uh, manuals for the um, assembly of the mechanics, the assembly of the electronics, and uh, the workbooks for the classroom. And there are also materials for the teacher. Um, and then set of batteries and, and all that jazz. We just give them a complete package to work with. And the crate is so the robots, once they're built, can be safely stored on a shelf somewhere. Because, you know, they're fairly delicate. You don't want to stick them loose on the shelf and have them fall. That will break things. So how do we teach them programming? This is what they start doing really, really quickly. And what you see here is mnemonics. So that's not what they're actually programming, but it is what they're doing. The robots only know pen up, pen down, forward and reverse in millimeters, and left and right, or turn, in degrees. And it turns exactly around the pen. So if it turns a circle and it's calibrated properly with a screwdriver, um, then it will actually just leave a dot, not a little circle, okay? Um, so what we play with in the classroom is, one of the first things we do is we like to 
teach me um, how to walk. And I tell the kids, you can teach me how to walk by um, telling me which joint to move. And the only joints you're allowed to move now are my hip joint, my knee joint, and my ankle joint. So we get this effect of, you know, move your, move your hip joint, um, you know, 90 degrees up. So I stand there like that until I fall over. And anyway, kids, like, kids try to work out how to make someone walk. And the, the objective of that is actually figuring out that it's not easy at all to make a robot walk. It is atrociously hard. And that is why we actually don't give legs to most robots because it's actually a very hard problem. Um, there are robots that can walk effectively now, but they're expensive, <laughs> you know? It's not an easy thing, so we start to try to stay away from that. Um, but it also teaches the kids, you have to be really specific with your instructions because if you do something else, you know, I'm a dumb robot, I will just do what I'm told, which is not the same as what you intended, you know? What you meant and what you actually did are two different things. And then we work out, in terms of those instructions, forward, reverse, left, right, and, and uh, pen up and pen down, um, how to write that in the possible shortest way. Um, and that's what you get to here. Okay, so forward 75, uh, this means forward 75, left 135 degrees. So 30, 75 millimeters forward and 135 degrees left in a loop of eight and creates this pattern. So this is how they do the programming. Sometimes they program on the screen first, work out what they want to do, and then, um, then write down the program on the sheet of paper together with their group name. So there are groups of between four and six kids building a robot. There's generally five classes, uh, five robots per class. So this was the, was the Voyagers. They gave themselves that name. The robot's name was Bob, and um, they made an eight-pointed star. Okay? So the interesting thing is that this is, in a way, much lower level programming than you generally see for beginner programmers, but they're actually much faster at it. So the user interface we use, and I can't show that right now, um, the basic interface that the web server there presents is a little drag and drop interface. And each of the commands that I've just described has a little drag drop thing, and it's just like Scratch. Um, you can play with that. Most of the students actually dislike that interface because it slows them down. Now let that be a lesson to us. So these are 10-year-olds. We give them this nice visual drag and drop interface so it's nice and convenient. Please get rid of it. It slows us down, yeah? Because they can write that much quicker. And believe me, when we were first discussing this, one girl in the corner was, um, in one of the classes, was writing a full page with two or three columns of these mnemonics because she was designing a whole robot with ears, eyes, antennae, mouth, everything. Um, later on, they actually drew it and they were debugging it on paper, you know, things scratched out, fixed up, and so on. That's how they work. That's how they think. That's perfectly fine with them. That drag-drop interface was actually a huge hindrance. Um, so we now also have a Python library and the next workshops that will be done in the first term next year I'll do the visual interface and the Python library, and we'll just see which kids like what best. And after that, we may just end up in pure Python because I think the kids, you know, you don't need to dumb things down. It's just whatever they're ready for, and we'll work out what they're ready for. It offers many opportunities because the visual interface has, um, you know, it doesn't have the ability to work with variables, input, and, and other things. I would love a script that, um, you know, one of the kids could write a script give me how many star, uh, how many points you want on your star, and it will calculate how many degrees to turn and just do it for you in the proper loop. It's entirely doable, but you can't do it in the visual interface. It can be done in Python or another interface. The communication between the computer and the, um, and the robot is a web socket or a raw socket. So it's really, really simple in terms of communication. So, um, so this teaches a bit of computational thinking and, 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 and introduction to programming. Some of the kids actually have been doing programming. Um, I also do a bit of always do a bit of a poll on that. So some kids play on Khan Academy, which does Java, uh, JavaScript um, in a kind of visual way. It's actually pretty cool um, for JavaScript. Um, some kids have played around on Raspberry Pis. There were a few. Some kids have played around with Arduino. That's pretty cool. Hey? So pr senior primary school plays with Arduino. And um, uh, quite a few kids play with Scratch, um, which, you know, that, that's also fine. Um, 
So that there's a little bit of experience there, but not an awful lot. So this is often the first, first introduction to programming. Um, so what do we do, um, or how do we do this? We, we try to integrate with the curriculum. And the reason is um, that many things need to be added into the curriculum. There's all these demands with new bits of the national curriculum um, coming up, and it needs to find a spot in the limited hours that the teacher has to deal with everything. So we try to weasel things in to existing subjects. So what the robotics uh, program does is it fits particularly into year five mathematics. In year five mathematics, um, the kids start to work with different measurements, you know, millimeters and centimeters and conversions between them, which is kind of convenient, and with angles, obtuse angles, rect uh, right angles, um, um, which is obtuse, acute angles, and, and so on. And, you know, working with the robots, particularly with the, as you will appreciate now, if you draw an angle in a certain way, the robot has to move a certain angle, but it is not necessarily the angle that you will measure later. It depends on where you come from. Um, it's quite interesting. When you stick the roof on top of a house, you need to think really, really carefully how many degrees you actually need to turn. Um, so, um, yes, it's, it's quite, an, quite useful to have that, that feedback loop there. Um, now, how and why do we provide those materials? Um, most teachers in primary schools are not specialists. They are generalists because they teach you how to read and write, they teach you mathematics and science and all the other bits. They're quite happy to do extra bits, but please don't ask them to develop the materials because they either don't have the expertise, some do obviously, or they don't have the time or don't have both. You know, it's, it's painful, but they're quite happy to do these things. They're very, very interested. They're fully aware that the world is big out there and that the kids need to be ready for it. So it's a matter of suitable resources and actually providing it in a way that is useful for the kids. So with this robotic program, um, it's one of the programs we do with a school and, with, and we come actually into the class because there's so many aspects to it. We could do PD for the teachers to do it themselves, but it may not be worthwhile. We can provide extra value there. So they purchase the kits from us and then essentially buy a bit of our time for us to do some of the workshops, which we spread out over four or five weeks. And then, um, of which one is introduction, um, two are soldering and mechanical assembly, and two are programming. And then sometimes uh, an, an extra presentation towards the broader school of what they've achieved. And there's sometimes also a parents, um, parents demonstration session. Um, so, yep, so those are the things we, we try to deliver to the, to the teachers so they can do what they need to do. Um, assessment can be done. Of course, this is cross-curricular because we're doing a bit of science, we're doing a bit of maths and so on. We're actually also doing a bit of English. We wrangled a, an ethical dilemma using robots um, in there as an optional extra using Asimov's law of robotics, which of course also sends the kids to the library and their, their parents' bookshelf, seeing how many Asimov books they can find and feeding that back, you know, just getting it in there a little bit, see, see what they come up with. Um, of course, you and I may have heard about Asimov, but the kids may not have, and now they have. So that kind of thing. So assessment and cross-curricular projects can be done, provided you actually work out which question relates to which subject. It has to be mapped back, because in the end, the requirement is on the teacher to do an assessment for each of the subjects, like maths and English and, and science. So as long as we map it back, they're able to assess it. They could assess multiple things in one in one, sh one test sheet, as long as it is manageable to actually get it back out again. So that's, that's the way we manage that so far. So programming, as far as I'm concerned, fits nicely in with mathematics. Um, that is the cleanest way of doing it so far, I think. Um, robotics is roughly science, but also a bit of engineering. Um, orienteering fits into HPE, but also maths. Um, so, you know, the list there is not even complete. Um, 3D printers are maths and science. Again, printing is design tech, you know, it works like that. Okay, open tools. How much time have I got? Perfect. Excellent. Um, so open tools, why do we use open tools? Um, of course, you know, open source conference, but why? Schools have an inevitably a limited budget. So quite a few schools, particularly the private ones, some Catholic ones, and some, you know, bouncy fast um, uh, um, state schools buy, for instance, Lego robotics. As I mentioned, I love Lego, but my goodness, it's expensive stuff. 
we can buy five of these mirror bots for one LEGO robotics kit. That's the ratio. And with this, we get the advantage of we are able to solder it. Don't have to. You can buy them pre-soldered, but we can solder them. You get the assembly. You get to actually draw with them. LEGO robots do not have a pen. Um, I think you can hack it in, but it becomes a bit more awkward. The mechanics are actually quite nifty there. It's not easy to replicate that. Anyway, so, you know, in terms of budget, we can do better. Um, not necessarily with this product, but just in general as a way of thinking. Enabling beyond the school environment. Many tools, whether hardware or software, are not available outside, um, outside of school because the, the kids will not have access to them. Um, there will be restrictions if they need to actually purchase that stuff. Sometimes software licenses are available for students and live up to three years afterwards. But, you know, what happens after the three years? Not longer available. They suddenly have to stop using it. Doesn't mean they're no longer interested. That would be a pity. And for pretty much most of those things, there are open source alternatives. So for that reason, I think it's important for educational purposes. Huh? Um, I like seeing tools that have a diverse source in terms of getting, getting materials and kits available because then we're not stuck with one vendor that may go away. Um, and also it enables getting new stuff. And um, I'll just give you an example. Um, so I, I prefer Arduino over Lego as a concept. Um, and um, the reason is that Arduino gets done by many different companies. Um, you can choose which form it will take and you can actually put it together with Lego if you want. You can control Lego using an Arduino, but then you still have the expensive components. And I'll give you an example. A sonar sensor in Lego space costs about $50. In the real world, it costs between $1 and $3. And then you have to plug it into something and a bit of interfacing. So by the time you, if you want to make it compatible with Lego, you might spend $10 on it. But $10 is still not $50, and that is where the difference comes in. Now, if you invent a new sensor, you know, something new comes up and, and you want to connect that, the LEGO environment doesn't know about it. So how do you plug in that new development? You can't do it. So, you know, why bother? Um, I'd like to work with other things. So in a way, it is a, a case of beyond LEGO. Um, it's a hindrance now rather than a benefit at this point. Um, doesn't mean you can't use Lego to build stuff, but using its electronic platform, I think, is a hindrance for schools. Um, that said, I very much prefer them using Lego over nothing. Yeah? So, yeah, if a school has been doing that over the last couple of years, absolutely fantastic. And in the meantime, the real world with Arduino and other, you know, Raspberry Pis and other things has caught up. Um, but there are still companies developing a platform and everybody must use this platform. I'm really very much disinterested. <laughs> I, get, I get emails about this and it's like, no, not, not cool. Um, I like teaching people concepts and skills rather than products. And that is one of the key things we present with those open tools. So I'm not actually selling open source anywhere because it is pretty much a, that's a useless exercise. You know, you must use Linux because it's better. That's a geek argument, really don't care, it doesn't work. Um, however, think of it this way. Think OpenOffice and Microsoft Office. Um, the difference between OpenOffice and Microsoft Office is about the same as the difference between one version of Microsoft Office and the next version. Yeah? And people sometimes need to be retrained a little bit. However, and then there's a whole conversation about the, uh, the um, uh, what's it called? The, um, you know, what the industry standard is, what will you most see out there? I really don't care about that. And I, I now have an argument that I think works and I'll run it by you. You all, uh, who here has a driving license? Yeah? Most of us, okay. Did we learn how to drive a Holden Astra 1988 with automatic transmission? No, but we are entirely capable of driving one whether we, you know, like to or not. Um, we learned how to drive a car. Now, you can get a limited license with just automatic. Fine. That's a very clear distinction. But, yeah, essentially what, what people are presenting with that, this is the industry standard, they're essentially saying you should get a license for a particular year model for a particular type of brand of car, which is completely daft when you see it in that context. So I would encourage you, please try this on your friends and see what happens next. 
don't necessarily try to convert them to using all this stuff, but you know, play, play with that. And it might actually be more effective than the old argument of this is better. Um, I'll get to you, Paul. Questions at the end, works better. Um, so that's one of the ways we now bring these things into the classroom. Okay. Um, vision and approach. Fundamentally, I don't like um, magic boxes. Um, I like to know what's in them. I like to know how they work. Um, sadly, therefore, I know way too many things about too many boxes, but I think it's quite useful. And essentially, I've turned um, that, that saying um, around. If you disassemble that advanced technology back to something we can understand, which we can because humans built it, yeah? Um, it is no longer magic, and I think that is a really, really useful thing. Um, and it's still cool stuff. So, you know, when you know how a magician does a trick, it's still a cool trick. It doesn't make it any less cool. It's just very much more useful. And I think many people now walk around the world and they really have no idea how the video player works, how their mobile phone works, and all the other stuff works. And that's when you get these really scary um, interactions between the technology and the humans, um, where the humans ascribe all kinds of super, supernatural and super technological attributes to a piece of technology, which is no different from, you know, seeing lightning in the sky and ascribing it to the thunder gods. It's exactly the same thing. So because many people are now not familiar with this kind of stuff, we're now, you know, ascribing nasty, um, nasty dangerous things and having, having uh, scary thoughts about those, um, about those aspects. So I'd like to you know, work with kids before they're actually consciously aware of that kind of stuff that it doesn't need to be scary. Um, broad exposure to different things. I don't expect them all to become electronic engineers when doing the soldering and the, and the robotics, but some will. And it's more than an hour of playing with something. They'll actually play with it over a number of days, over a couple of weeks, and they can get a bit of an impression about it. And it may leave a lasting impression of, I w really want to do this, or I really don't care for this, and that's cool too. Um, implicit, inoc implicit inoculation is something I came up with. And so we absolutely never, ever make a distinction between, for instance, boys, girls, or any other subgroups in the classroom. It is not worthwhile, in my opinion, particularly at that age. If we start talking about that kind of stuff, you know, particularly talking to girls about robotics, because otherwise they might not get exposed, they start wondering, hmm, there's some, should I be different? Is this different? It's not different. And it really doesn't make a difference when we observe this, and we don't make that distinction, it works just fine. I think what will happen is that the kids who do this stuff will encounter someone in high school, and it might be a teacher, it might be a well-meaning relative, or, or a, a fellow student that says, ah, you know, robotics is not for you, or you know, mathematics is you know, something for boys, or whatever. They can just say like that. I did soldering in year four. You know, that's the best, you know, the best antidote, I reckon, because they already know they can do it. It will go straight past them, problem solved. Um, I mentioned a quick um, thing about um, offline options. I try to take a lot of things offline. One of the reasons is you want to have tactile activities. That's really important for kids. Other, thing, other reason is that many online services are online and logged into that online service for the convenience of the provider of that service. Have a thought for all the kids and the teachers who need to keep track of all these passwords. They're crying in a corner at the moment. It is painful. Um, so if you provide an app, I know you don't control it anymore when you have them install it locally, but you really save their, uh, the, the teachers and the kids an awful lot of pain. So you know, it can be even a locally run web app, but make it something that can be lo run locally and offline. And you may find it amazing, but some schools have a dreadful internet connection. They cannot hack all this stuff online. It will not work. Um, so for that reason, too, it needs to be offline. Um, I quickly mentioned the digital technologies curriculum, which has just been approved by the minister. Um, and long story short, programming is now in the national curriculum um, from year three onward. And you can see this as a good thing or a bad thing, because with all these overloaded teachers, what can possibly go wrong? <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, it's a glorious opportunity to get it right this time. I think that's, that's wonderful. So OpenSTEM is actually working 
on, on ideas on how to you know, make that fun in the classroom in a way that we can actually run it. Obviously not by going into every classroom, but actually do the professional development, provide the materials and that kind of stuff. While I'm waiting your questions, I'll show you another thing that we run by the kids. And that's our little critters. So that's one of the things we do while, um, while we demonstrate things to get people thinking. We have a discussion about, you know, what might robots look like? How might they move? So we make a couple of robots and make them move. And these specifically, this one specifically has no wheels because, you know, why bother? It's much more cute. So this is Caterpillar. And Caterpillar crawls. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Okay, now I'll let him loose. Go on, off you go. Okay, this I call so that I, I call him Caterpillar. He's got other nicknames made by the kids, but um, that uh, that works quite nicely. He's having some trouble on the floor. Okay, I call this one Hexaplod. Um, so, what we the reason I do this? So all the red bits, by the way, are three D printed. So the total cost of this is, how much do you think? In materials. Of course, a couple of weeks of work if you calculate it back, but how much, how much, how much do you think it cost? A little bit more. Yeah, that's about right, $35, $40, and that's including little LiPo battery and, and, and all other kinds of stuff. Um, so, and I'll, I'll put them on the table later and you can play with them, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, so the kids love this stuff, because it's a bit different. Um, we can also talk about uh, biomimicry in, in robotics, which is a whole extra subject. You can, one class completely ran with it and found extra resources, did a whole project on that. Awesome. Um, yes, robot runs off again. Awesome. Um, so I specifically do things like that. First of all, because I hadn't built a robot before. Must, must do something different. Um, the other reason is making sure that people know it doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't have to be complicated. I don't have a degree in robotics. I didn't work for NASA. I can still do this. I'm nifty, I admit that, but you know, other people can do this. Hexaplot is like the next level from that. Um, Hexaplot has three servos, a tiny little Arduino as well. That's an Arduino as well, by the way. Um, the eyes don't work at the moment, so they're, um, they should work, but they don't. Let's put it that way. So I've created a bit of random in there. Um, to make it do funny moves anyway, and it has the battery, and that's about it. Its legs are six paper clips. Yeah? Again, just to make the point that you can. Um, so he's very awkward, but he moves. Let's have a look. On this surface, I have no idea. There you go. Isn't he cute? On that note, I might ask everyone okay. to thank Arian for his talk. Any, any now, questions? There is lunch out there, so we'll take questions now, but don't feel rude if you go out to grab yep, some lunch fine. in the meantime. Thank you. Um, and I'll walk around with a microphone, um, duck out if you want some food, otherwise hang around for some questions. And Paul there had a question earlier. Yeah. Arjun, I'm just uh, interested in how Open STEM is actually engaged by schools to come in and do work. Do you, do you um, make proposals to them? Do you get unsolicited proposals? The answer to that is yes, <laughs> both. Um, we, we try to contact schools, um, but of course we're, we're as interesting as the next bit of spam that, that contacts them. So what we would love is, well, what we do love is a parent or another connection who is, has some connection with the school and knows the person at the school who might be interested in that to take it further within the school and then we work with them to, to do that. So we're slowly spreading our spreading our web of, of influence there and of course once it things happen at one school one school talks to the next school because all the principals talk and all the you know there there's clusters of um of people working there um and it's fairly early days um we as you saw on, the, on one of the slides we ended up in a newspaper and that also triggered other other responses and um, you know that kind of stuff is, is what happens. But ideally, 
things are initiated through some connection with the schools because otherwise, essentially, the only opportunity we have in terms of contact details is communicating with the principal of the school. They are busy CEOs, essentially, even on a primary school level. They're very, very busy people. So, you know, sometimes we get a chat out of it with them, but, you know, chances are it's like part of the stack and they're, they're not disinterested necessarily, but they might have other priorities and it goes sideways, even though someone else in the school, an individual teacher or a head of learning or a head of curriculum or a department, uh, department person, uh, teacher librarian may be interested in it, but they will never see that information, but we don't have contact details for them and we don't know that they are the ones in that school. So contacting through inter indirect channels often works best. There's also the PNCs um, that have quite a bit of influence in a school in terms of what happens. And the, I'm, I'm calling it influence because a PNC is actually the only entity inside schools that is allowed to fundraise. And schools have a very good ability of funding things that they really want to do. And sometimes it's, it's um, just in the general budget. And in many cases, lots of things that happen at the school are funded by the PNC. So there's those two income streams. So the PNC is actually really important to also engage with. Okay, yep, hi. How do I control the Miro bot? Ah, well, after, after this talk finishes, you will grab a laptop or my laptop and we'll control it. Okay, definitely. Um, Paul, Paul has run, different Paul. Paul Waper has run off. He disappeared. he disappeared, time. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. Okay, yep. Uh, it was just a question just regarding uh, attending principal conferences. Uh, and obviously uh, parents and friends type conferences and things like that or meetings. So um, yep. have you uh, sort of taken that angle so you can sort of hit them all at one time? Um, I've been, but not in this capacity, been to a recent PNC conference, uh, to the Queensland PNC conference. It's a bit tricky to get into conferences like that, um, doing something specifically. You could have a booth there, but it gets expensive. Um, in the program, you know, with connections, I'm happy to talk with anyone doing any talk. About nine years ago, I did a talk, well before I was doing this as a business, I did a talk on databases um, at the Australian Computers and Education Conference uh, um, combined with QSite. So that's ACEC and QSite up in Cairns um, together with Sean Nyquist from QUT. Um, so, you know, that was an opportunity to work together with Sean and getting in there. If I just submitted a paper on my own, would have never gone anywhere. So it's a matter of connections and links. So. If you have any, please, yes, sure. Yep, great. Okay, thank you. I'll be okay, out and about you can play with these things. Um, so can I have one more round of applause for Arian? And here's a gift on behalf of the conference organizers. Thank you.